Good morning. Good morning. Today I will be reading 2 John. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God, the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of you children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver in the Antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked hard for, but may win in full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in the wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greets you. Okay, thank you, Anna. So today we're going to be talking about 3 John, the whole book this morning. Only 13 verses, but wow, powerful, deep, lots of good stuff there, just packed, jam-packed. But I've titled the message today, A Short But Urgent Note from John. A Short But Urgent Note from John. Now, once again, John is not named. He's not named in 1 John, 2 John, or 3 John. Uh, actually, in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. But his name is not there. Only in Revelation does he uh, bring out his name. He says, I, John, in, in Revelation. But in Second John, he's not named at all. But everybody knows, not even the, uh, the, the most liberal of scholars would even question that this was written by John. This is something that's known by all. His, uh, his style is known. And, and just the things that he wrote go along with who he was. He... He uh, identifies himself as the elder, the elder. And uh, the word is presbyteris, presbyteris, we get the word presbyterian. The Presbyterians call themselves that because it means elder and they use elder rule like we do. So he's the elder that way and as far as administration of the church, but also He's an elder because he was in his 90s, well into his 90s when he wrote this. He wrote it toward the end of the first century, and uh, he was an old man. He was elderly, and also he was the only one of the 12 apostles left. All the other ones had been killed. They'd all been martyred, and he was the only one left. And so all of the uh, apostleship really was in him. So he's the elder, and he's writing to the elect lady. The word in the Greek is electa, which is a feminine word for elect. And it could have been her name, electa. But she's the elect lady and her children whom I love. And so that's who it's being written to. And uh, there's a question, you know, that's probably be argued forever. And that is, was he writing to a literal lady named electa and her literal children? Or was he writing in code? You know, uh, the lady represented a, a church and the children were the members of the church. I happen to think that he was writing to uh, a particular lady. And I think that she probably was um, a prominent lady in the church. It could be that she was wealthy and her church was large enough to have the congregation meet in her house. Some buildings were being made at that time, some church buildings, but still, a lot of churches were still meeting in homes, and just like John Mark's mother in Jerusalem, she probably had a big house so that everybody could come and worship in her house. So I think that, uh, she, that, Paul, uh, that John was writing to an actual lady, and of course, uh, Henrietta Mears thinks so. In fact, being a lady, she points out that this is the only epistle written to a lady. 
to a woman. And also, uh, Warren Wiersbe believes that this was written to a woman, but of course, Dr. David Jeremiah thinks that it was symbolically written to a church. So um, whether that'll ever be cleared up in our time, I don't think so, but uh, I think he was writing to a woman. But it's all really a warning against false teachers. And the message really, though, overall, is to live truthfully. So let's take a look at the details of this letter. First of all, the first six verses tell us how truth and love work together. And I'm just going to read those six verses, so follow along with me. To the elder, that is Presbyteros, the elder who is John, the elder to the elect lady, who could really be a regular lady named Electa, and her children, whom I love in the truth. Now, this is not a love note here, because the word love all the way through here, it's in four times in this book, and it's agape or agapao. It's a, if it's agapao, it's a noun. If it's agape, it's a verb. Whom I love, agape, in the truth. And not only I, but also those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. Now, what is grace? Well, grace is uh, receiving wonderful things that we don't deserve. Salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, the promise of heaven, this relationship that we have with God, the relationship we have with our fellow Christians, the blessing of answered prayers. There are so many things that we have that we really don't deserve, but God has given to us by grace. Mercy, on the other hand, is not receiving things we do deserve, not receiving bad things that we do deserve in eternity and hell and other things. And uh, in his mercy, we don't receive those things because we put our faith in Christ. So grace, mercy, and peace. What is peace? Well, when you have peace with God and peace with each other, we have peace within. And so that's the peace that he gives us. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. There's truth and love again together. Verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And as I first read that this week, I thought, what? You're rejoicing because some of her children are walking in truth? I thought, doesn't that mean that some of her children are not walking in the truth? And then I kind of meditated on that passage and thought about it and prayed about it. And I thought, well, maybe there's some other scenarios Maybe it is that the last time he saw her, none of her children were walking in the truth, but now some are. Or maybe he says, I found some of your children walking in truth. So maybe they were grown children and he was traveling and happened to come across these children of hers that were walking in the truth. Whatever the case, he says, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in the truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So what is all of this stuff about commandments? Well, maybe I got to back up though here first. He's talking about how truth and love work together. And somebody said that 2 John begins, resolves, revolves around, and ends with love and truth. And that's the case. It's just love and truth over and over again. So truth must be tempered by love. If you're writing notes, if you're filling in blanks, truth must be tempered by love. Verses 1 through 3 again. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. So truth must be tempered by love. Somebody said one time that uh, the world needs more warm hearts and fewer hot heads. More warm hearts and fewer hot heads. And I think that's true. But you'll notice that in this book, you have the word truth repeated over and over five times and the word love repeated four times in these 13 verses. And that's because Ephesians 5.14, Paul said that we should speak the truth in love. 
Speak the truth in love. You know, spoken in spite, truth can hurt real bad. Spoken in spite, truth can hurt real bad. But spoken in love, truth can hurt real good. Have you ever had somebody that was so concerned about you that they came to you and they really didn't want to, but they felt the Lord was leading them and they told you something that you needed to hear about yourself and it, it hurt. But it hurt really good because for one thing, that person cared about you and another thing, it helped you to clear something up to make your life a little bit better. So spoken in love, truth can hurt real good. Now, of course, we need to be willing to receive the truth. Paul wrote to the Galatians, and he asked a question. He said, is it really true that uh, I've become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They consider, you consider me your enemy because I tell you the truth? He said to the, to the Colossians or the Galatians, have I really become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So we need to be willing to receive the truth. But truth must be tempered by love. And love then, here's the other blanks to fill out here. Love must be guided or governed by truth. Verses 4 through 6. I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment by the Father from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So what is that commandment business that he is talking about here? Well, we've talked a lot about the 10 commandments being an expression of love. The first four commandments are how to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. The last six are how to love your neighbor as yourself. You look at those 10 commandments and you see that's true. And beyond that, Jesus said in John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another even as I love you. And that's not the only time that he commanded them to love one another. And 1 John 4, 21 says, he, Jesus, has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So this is how truth and love work together. Very important that we speak the truth in love. So then he goes on, he kind of changes the subject a little bit to talk about how to follow, how to deal with false teachers in verses 7 through 11. And the first thing he says is to be aware of the threat of false teachers. Look at verses 7 through 9. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist. And by the way, who are those deceivers? Can somebody name them? They deny that Jesus Christ had a fleshly body. They was born into the world through the Virgin Mary with a fleshly body. Who would those false teachers be? You bet. It was the Gnostics. That's right, Dan. These were the Gnostics. You remember? They thought that anything physical was inherently evil. So our bodies are inherently evil. So how could Jesus be born into the world in a physical body? And so he's dealing with that right here. He says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Antichrist means against Christ or trying to be in the place of Christ, which is the way that the devil is. The devil is against Christ, but he also wants to take God's place. <clears throat> so he's called the antichrist. And I was really shocked. Here I've been in the ministry for 40 some years. And I didn't realize that the word Antichrist is only used five times in the New Testament. Did you know it's not in the book of Revelation? And did you know it's not in First or Second Thessalonians that also deals with end time prophecy and the coming of Christ? It's only in the writings of John, only five times, and that's in First and Second John. And yet, he says this is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Now, in um, Revelation, the Antichrist is called the beast. In 1 Thessalonians, he's called the man of sin and the son of perdition. So anyway, that was kind of a wake up to me. So he says, many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. And the reason this is so important, if he didn't come into the flesh, then that kind of makes the crucifixion a joke, right? Because how can you nail a spirit to a cross? 
and what pain would there be if you nailed us up? He, he was on that cross. He ex had excruciating pain as he shed his blood for our salvation. And uh, so to say that he didn't come in the flesh would be ridiculous. So then he says in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. What were the things that they had worked for? Well, the apostles had gone throughout the Roman Empire, preaching the gospel of Christ, winning people to Christ, bringing them together as churches, forming churches, and then establishing those churches, and then going back and checking up on those churches to help them to keep growing in their faith, and this was hard work. They traveled miles and miles on foot to do this. And they were preaching the gospel and they were winning people to Christ and discipling them and, and uh, strengthening churches. This is hard work. But if false teachers get in and they start preaching a false gospel, well, that's not a very good thing. Because as Adrian Rogers put, put it, a false gospel leads to a false conversion that leads to a very real hell. Because, you see, the true gospel saves, but a false gospel keeps people from being saved because they don't come to the true gospel. So that's how important this thing is. And so he says in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we've worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Now, what is that reward? Well, again, I think that is the reward at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ happens in heaven, so it's only for Christian. It's, it's not to determine whether you're going to heaven or hell. You're already in heaven, but it's to determine your gifts. I mean, the, to determine the rewards that you will have in addition to eternal life in heaven. And so in verse 9 then, he says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So he's saying, beware of the, thr the threat. That is the threat of false teachers. And then he says, don't flirt with danger in verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So let me give you three reasons that you should not invite cultists in your home. First of all, if they come knocking at the door, you should not let them in. First of all, because most Christians are not equipped to argue doctrine with cultists. Um, you see them coming. These people are people who are trained in their beliefs. These are people who are trained to deal with what they know we're going to say to them. And uh, they can tie you in knots. And as a matter of fact, when I was just a new Christian and a teenager, I uh, allowed a couple of um, Mormon missionaries into our house. And don't get the idea that I don't love Mormons. I do. I grew up among Mormons. When I go back to my class reunion, many of my classmates are Mormons. And uh, one of these missionaries was a friend of our family. And uh, when he was at his, on his Mormon mission down in South America, we were very worried about him because there was a big earthquake that took place. And he asked if he could come with another missionary into our house. So I said, okay. And my parents went down to the basement <laughs> And I see, I was a new Christian. I was going to a Bible preaching church and I was in Sunday school learning a lot and youth group and the Jesus movement was going and I was going to show those guys some things out of the Bible. And the way it turned out, they turned me, they, they tied me in knots because I wasn't prepared. And the average Christian isn't. And Mormons actually say truthfully that 50% of their converts come out of churches like ours, Bible believing churches. So, one reason not to let them in the house is because most Christians are not equipped to argue doctrine with cultists. And then uh, inviting them in may give the appearance that we pre approve of their teachings or give the illusion of legitimacy of their teachings. And thirdly, in wartime, aiding and abetting the enemy is treason. And it's the same thing spiritually. Look at verses 10 and 11. Now, this is not me speaking. This is the Apostle John by the Holy Spirit, he says in verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. This is in the Bible. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. And so we might be helping them out if we invite them into our house. It doesn't mean that we don't love them. It just means that this is what the Bible says. So this is how 
truth and love work together. Truth must be tempered by love and love must be governed by truth. How to deal with false teachers? Be aware of the threat of false teachers. Don't flirt with danger. And then in verses 12 and 13, he's tying up loose ends. Verse 12, having many things to write to you, I did not wish to, you to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So he says, really, I've got a lot of things I want to tell you, but I want to tell them to you face to face rather than write them down and send it in a note. Now, writing is a good thing. The Bible is written. And aren't you glad that it is? And it's available to us today. But face to face sometimes beats writing. Face to face sometimes beats writing. You know, social media can cause all kinds of misunderstandings and friendships can be destroyed and people can be needlessly hurt. And the reason is on social media, you're ticky, ticky, tacky, and it's not face to face. And so people can be downright rude in social media. I've learned over the years that rude people are almost always thin-skinned and easily hurt themselves. And uh, my dad used to say to us kids, don't dish it out if you can't take it. But really, we shouldn't be dishing it out at all. But I think we tend to be more civil and have fewer misunderstandings face-to-face. -face. And part of the reason, I think, is because we can read each other's face. Now, they say that by age 50, you get the face that you deserve. I've got a face that uh, doesn't smile. And I think that I'm smiling, a big smile, and people say, Tom, smile. Why don't you smile? I just have a face that doesn't show expression, I guess. And uh, yet, when you're talking with people, you can usually read their expression, and maybe you sense something. And you might say, oh, no, I didn't mean this. This is what I really meant. And you can clear it up right there, face to face. So I think it's more, we can be more civil and fewer misunderstandings face to face. And so he says, Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now he gives a final greeting in verse 13. And it's interesting that the benediction is toward the first and the greeting is in the very last verse. He says, the children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. And so he's saying to Electa, You've got a sister, and I just uh, ran into her and her kids, and they tell you, they said to me to tell you hello. So balance truth with love. That's what he's saying here. Beware of the threat of false teachers, because remember, a false doctrine leads to a false salvation, which leads, or a false gospel leads to a false salvation that leads to a very real hell. Don't flirt with danger. Speak face to face whenever you can with your fellow Christians, and always. Speak words that strengthen and encourage each other. So, Heavenly Father, help me, help us all to watch our words. Be careful what we say, but uh, to be honest, but to be careful how we say it, Lord. Do we always say things in a way that will strengthen and encourage each other? Help us to be people who love each other, but who love each other in the truth, I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.